this started? Yep, that's what I'm doing right now. Cool. So I think what we'll do is we'll I'll just quickly run over this last section in chapter 22, then we'll transition over into uh, Ryan talking about 23. Um, so let me just share my screen here for this last part. Desktop one, share. All right, cool. So everybody can see these final kind of set of notes. Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Well, um, so to finish up chapter two, the last section that we had was talking about non-error failures. And really, this is talking about situations where you're not going to get an explicit error. And what do you do in those cases? And so we always have to keep in mind, and let me bump up the bump this up so people can see it a little Ooh. better. We have to keep in mind that functions may fail or be invalid without throwing an error, right? So it is on us as our programmers to, you know, know what our functions are doing, know what our code is doing, and understand that even if we write the best code ever, it may return invalid results. And so in those situations, R is not going to be smart enough to tell us what's wrong. Uh, there are certain situations where we might get a warning rather than an error, and a warning basically is like just a message to the user, which is saying, hey, there's some, there might be something wrong here that you want to look into further. Um, so if you do any like the package development stuff in the package development books, they do this conversation about the differences between warnings and errors. And really the idea is, is that warnings aren't necessarily anything that's wrong. Your code's going to run, but you may want to look into some stuff a little bit further. However, for debugging purposes, if you want to, you can turn warnings into explicit errors by setting your options from warn equal to two. Uh -huh. And so if at any case that you do have a warning, uh, if you have this option set, it will stop just like an error and it will tell you what the what the error message is. Um, you can that also use like, the call. Sorry, real quick. I was just going to yeah. say like, I, I remember looking into this and talking to somebody who was like really big into development. And they said that they do this. And I was kind of thinking like for a lot of warnings, that's meaningful, but there's also a lot of like really ticky tack warnings. You know what I mean? I don't know if people like, it just seems like some of the warnings, you know, like if you're doing a model and it's like model has, you know, failed to converge, that's actually a warning. I think it's not a, it's not an error. So that's a pretty serious warning, but there's other warnings like, was it, you know, like, um, I don't know, but it just seems like, um, I don't know, would you guys do this in your own practice? Well, I mean, I think it's, uh, I mean, I think the best thing about warning is, is that your code's going to run, mm -hmm. you know, so like, you know, your code's going to run, but there might be certain situations where, like, there may be some like weird input or some weird output that mm -hmm. happens where you just want to warn the user to be like, Hey, you may have not done something right. So you just want to look into it further. So yeah. I don't really have an explicit where I've used that before, but I, you know, you don't, I guess like, cause I'm just looking at like the output from the, like running, like to serving the, the book chapters or to serve mm -hmm. the notes here. And I see that I have a warning, like a glaring warning message right now. That's like, Hey, there's this warning and I'm not even really going to read it too much in depth, but it's like, there's a right. warning somewhere in some of these notes, but my notes still run. So, right. you know. Yeah. I mean, um, I've done that. I've used this before just for the main purpose with that is to, so it'll trap the error so you can see where it happened. Right. That's a, otherwise the warning will just go flying by and you won't know where it happened. So you can make the thing stop. So you can then put a, you know, do a debug on that. Right. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's probably true. And then like the the one, the most recent one that I ran across was like, I used to use the dplyr verb separate, but I know it's been, it's been depreciated, but you know, where you can separate strings. Depre so, deprecated, I think is the term. You're yeah, deprecated or whatever, but like that would have a warning message. So like if you didn't have the right pattern of where you wanted to split the string, it would be like warning, you know, filling in NAs or something like that. Right. Now that might be behavior that you want, right? But it's just, you know, if you don't want that, then you can at least tell the user to be like, hey, this is something you might want to look into a little bit more, you know? So um, there's a lot of talk about it in the R for or the package development book about mm -hmm. the differences of when you should use it, when you shouldn't. So I highly suggest looking at that. Um, there's some other functions here, you know, if, uh, if you want to use the call stack along with this, you can do like do with one restart or with one restart. I 
really didn't mess around with these functions because I just keep going back to using the interactive debugger with um, browse or, um, you know, breakpoints if you have the opportunity to, but there's additional functions to help you help catch or give you a call stack in those situations where you're getting like a non-error failure. Then there's some more discussion about with abort that pops up again, but, uh, you know, I looked into it a while back ago. I don't know what happened to with abort, so it's just not being called anymore inside of the Arlang package, so I'm not going to discuss it more, but the book does discuss it. If anybody has any information on where it's at, I'm not really 100% sure um, what happened to with abort, but the book does talk about it as a debugging tool. And then there's also like last trace, which will give you the chance to like look at the call stack from the last error. So if you run into a warning or something, you should be able to run last trace and it should give you a call stack that you can further dig into. Other situations where you might get non-errors, uh, a function might never return. So um, the book says this is particularly hard to debug. And so you might have to terminate the function and look at the trace back manually. Otherwise, you're just going to have to rely on print debugging, which we talked about last time. It's a strategy to debug your code. So um, if you have to, put those print statements inside of your function um, and then use that to help you debug. Worst case scenario is if you crash R, um, I've done this plenty of times before and I had no idea what happened to it. Um, but usually if it does this, the book says that this is something that is happening one potential that could be happening is, is that there's a bug inside of like some of the compiled or C code. Um, but if you want to kind of dig into the C or C++ code, that's a little bit, or that's behind some of these functions, you're going to need some other type of debugger that's going to help you debug that C and C++ code because the tools that we talked about will not do that. And then the last thing is if you do come across a bug in a package or base R, um, it's always good practice uh, to contact the package maintainer. So, you know, check the description file, see who the maintainer is. There should be information in there about who you should reach out to in cases like that. Um, or most, um, I shouldn't say all, but a good majority of these packages are hosted on GitHub. You can file an issue. If you are, uh, if you know how to do version control and everything and you follow the terms of contribution for these different packages, um, people are more than welcome to you to uh, issue a pull request fixing the bug too. So if you have the skill set to do that, it's highly suggested that you, um, you know, provide a, a pull request with the fix for the package itself. However, if you just want to raise the issue, um, you should put together a small um, reproducible example so that people can see like exactly what you're seeing. And so it's good to have a reprex in those issues that you file so that people can see the bug then fix the bug and then integrate it into the package or the next package version. So um, then the last last, which we talked about, there's just some useful resources. Um, some of these were from the previous cohort, but again, I'm going to highlight this one again for anybody who's here or watching this later in the future. Watch Object of Type Closure is Subsettable by Jenny Bryan. I can't emphasize enough how awesome this talk is, so check it out. Hmm. But there's also a couple books to read, too. Um, and I haven't really looked at a couple, another chapter, and then there's a, um, I Hadley did a video about minimal rec recs for a Shiny app. Check them out. Um, they'd be well worth your time to see some little um, debugging, like, strategies from these talks and these chapters, so. Yeah. Ryan, you're going to say something? Oh, uh, no, I, I, I actually was just, I think I, I was going to say, I have seen this object of the, the Jenny Bryan talk, and it is really cool. I, yeah, yeah, it's very I can rewatch it, though, because now I know so much more about closure, and what, you know, type of closure and all this subsettable. You know, I know that this whole thing means now. Yeah, it's, it's by far, and it's not even, and it goes a little bit further to, like, show you, like, her kind of thought process of how she goes about solving a bug and talking about all the different tools like it's one of those talks and I think I've already mentioned it here is like if somebody's learning how to do R and they have a little like understanding of how to use it that would be like one of the top five videos that I share with people by far yeah. so cool well that's all I have for chapter 22 um, yeah, I guess we'll transition over to Ryan here yeah. and then we'll go from there um yeah let me uh 
Can you all see my session? Got it. Okay. Right. So, um, like I said, this is, you know, the 23 and 24 are sort of like often presented together, it seems like in previous cohorts, because, you know, 23 is measuring performance and 24 is improving performance, right? So maybe there's a kind of a hand in hand type of a deal. But alas, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, we've only, we haven't gotten to 24. So that'll be next week. Um, so yeah, so understand, you know, what are the objectives, understand how to improve your code for making it faster. I would actually argue that I don't know how much we really <laughs> learned how to make code faster. We kind of learned how to visualize and make tables and things in this chapter to see where potential, you know, stuff is slowing down. But um, I don't know that we saw so much about how to make stuff faster. I think that comes later. But um, yeah, so, you know, what are the tools you can do to, you know, improve the code and what can you do to profile it? So, yeah, this, um, couple different, like, uh, I, unfortunately, I redundantly put the same thing here, which is, you know, this idea of profiling is when we, you know, we do a runtime for each line using realistic inputs, which I thought was, that was an interesting sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, thing to kind of quantify, qualify, right? So it's like realistic inputs. It can't just be like silly things that wouldn't necessarily reflect real usage. And uh, although we don't do a ton of it in this chapter, you know, you, you kind of experiment with alternatives to find faster code. And then uh, micro benchmark, which is kind of like more fine level, um, very, very, very accurate, very, very tiny amounts of time being measured kind of stuff at the end I'll talk about this briefly so um we're going to use um I'm actually not I, I'm not sure how you pronounce is it is it prop pro pro prof is or how do you, how are you guys pronouncing this actually proviz proviz that's kind of what I, is, I don't know prof, yes. I, I was saying proviz, that's kind of, the mess, it? <laughs> yeah it's it's uh, prof prof is I don't know whatever uh, so we'll be using that for the profiling part. And then later on, we will use the, the bench package, which uh, shout out to um, this guy. I don't know if you know who Jim Hester is. He, he used to work at our studio. He's, he made like a bunch of, he worked on a bunch of things. He lives in Cleveland. Uh, he goes to the local R users group and yeah, he made the bench package. So shout out to Jim. Cool. He, uh, uh, he yeah, works he on helped. Netflix now, doesn't he? Uh, I don't, I think so. Yeah, he, we, we haven't had an in-person meeting or that, not one that I've gone to. He was actually on, like we had a, we actually, we did, um, sorry, a little, a little tangent here. We did some chat beat GPT coding um, uh, on like a live session. It was, it was crazy. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and he was on that session. That was last week we had a meeting, but it was all remote. So hmm. um, yeah, I think that sounds right to Netflix though. So, okay, so we, um, we're going to use a profiler, which really is just about sampling the code uh, and, and stopping it at various time points and reporting, you know, what, what's happening and how long it takes. Um, you know, obviously we talk about it, they, they talk a little bit about it being like, you know, um, stochastic or like, you know, a, a statistical profiler, meaning, you know, because we're dealing with, you know, very, um, well, I mean, is the, the 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 run times could vary, you know, on the order of milla or micro or nanoseconds, and so you know we have to kind of sample this stuff repeatedly to kind of figure out, like, what, you know, what's, you know, where where does the distribution kind of land? Um, right. So now this example here, uh, I don't know if you all get a chance to look at this. So we're we're, go we're going to define three functions g or excuse me f g and h and uh, the first thing we're going to do is pause for 100 milliseconds and then run other functions so if you see here f we we, we pause and then we run g and then we run, we run h which are defined here um so yeah we, we, we want to run this and so um one thing he also mentions in the book which i don't even know that i would have even have thought to use it which is Instead of using pause, you know, you could use sys.sleep, which I guess is another way of sort of, you know, stopping um, performance for some amount of time. But I guess it doesn't actually show up in 
any of the output so there's no way for us to actually like see that as an event in the uh, programming um so yeah I don't, I don't know how um if if you guys had sense of this right so if we run f right um that means we should um have a pause and then we should run these two uh functions right mm -hmm. so i guess that makes sense i don't know um this is so this is like the this is what was taken from the um the book and um yeah this this like this this graph or this graphic that he had with the pause f pause gf yeah i i didn't it's, really I, necessarily I, understand I this <laughs> like i i understood what was going like i understand it's sampling like the code like it's running and sampling every yeah. one, one seconds right i understand that part of it but i just didn't oh. understand where you get like pause f and then pause gf then pause hgf you know is that yeah. just like what was running at that time anytime exactly. that we get a sample yeah, yeah. is that what it is I yeah guess. it's just showing you on the flame graph it's showing you um you know it's doing a sampling all on that timeline when it does a sample it says what's the call stack like well at this point the call stack is f and pause and then a little bit later at you know it constantly asks us over and over again every 10 milliseconds or they said right yeah or no well here yeah it says 10 milliseconds so it's every 10 milliseconds right um yeah okay so like this so this so i think what this is saying is is okay so so i think this goes from top to bottom right is that is that or, or is it wait a minute is it start from the, the bottom so the first thing we do is we run f and then we're well the time is along the x-axis yeah right? and then the call stack is along the y-axis so yeah f is all the whole time you're in f because you called f you're going to always be in f right and what's f doing well it's calling pause and then after right. after uh however long it waits for, it then calls G, and G in turn immediately calls pause, there's no delay. And then mm -hmm. after that pause, though, the G causes H, and H causes pause, calls pause, right? Right, That's right. all, it's, it's just walking you through that. Actually, what I understand, the sampling of those 10 milliseconds, mm -hmm. and so I thought yeah, the, why is this, I thought I the pause was 10 milliseconds, or is the pause longer? And your function didn't show up here because you didn't, you didn't put it in a separate file, right? Oh, I do, I do below, so I can, I, I'll show you in a second, um, hold on. Also, I, I, how long is, is the pause for? It's supposed to be for 100 milliseconds. Oh, 100, yeah. So it's right, 10, 10 sample periods, right? So at 10 times, it's going to call, it's going to pause and like, no, sorry, I shouldn't say the word pause. It's going to sample what's happening and it's going to say, ah, at this point, this is what the call stack looks like. And that's how it builds that up. And as you saw in the earlier part of the chapter, it actually saves these. You can actually do this manually by saving these uh, snapshot, these samples yourself to a file, but it gets right. really big and hard to read. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, I, I think I'll have that. Um, in a, That's not the only way to do this is in like, I think in C, for example, the, the user profile that I've used in the past is not random. It's a deterministic one. It just purposely it keeps track of every function call and every function return and every exception and what time it occurred and will give you exact numbers. But um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I know so Torch, High Torch, for example, has a, a sampling one, maybe because it's just too hard to to do a deterministic yeah. one yeah i, I also just use this so i just as a just for fun just to it's like I, you know obviously we're using the examples from the book i, this, I found this on the pro the pro proof viz website so this is oh. just a simpler example where we we're, we're, we're loading data we're plotting it and then we're um we're we're, we're filming we're, we're oh creating. that time we, that time we got the source somehow Oh, because you piece it in there into brackets. Okay. Yes, right. Yeah. So yeah. So the whole. So they that's the, the secret, huh? Yeah, I guess. Um, which they don't want to. They didn't want to do that in the book. So so we're saying that. We're start with, so this this goes from uh, bottom to top, right? So the first thing is is we have the, this. Well, what's even more left to that? There's a little yellow square there. What's that? Oh, oh, right, right. That's okay, that's yes. loading the data. So that's a data thing. When the data is, that takes a little bit of time, right? By itself. 70 milliseconds and then yeah this most of the time is spent in this plot formula or yeah, yeah. what is it doing and what's plot formula doing yeah interesting i well, think well that's 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 where, that's where they define we, we've defined the um oh also you can do this too right so you could we could just call this temp and i think it should give us like i think to your point um it should create a Oh, is it just like um, 
have some time out because the plot appears and I just like, I can't believe it's really taking that long to do the plot. plot. I feel like it's, there's some weird time out going on at the end there where it's yeah. already made the plot and it's just like waiting around to, for you to look at it or somewhere like that. Yeah. Actually, this is not as, this is not as what I was hoping that for. That looks totally yeah. Yeah. transparent, yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but anyway, yeah, so this is... So what is going on for that whole two seconds? It's got to be done by then. It must be just waiting for something to happen. Yeah. One thing I couldn't figure out is, no, okay, no, so, this is so this is actually the percent. So this is uh, somewhere in the book. I thought they said this was um, it was a percentage of the total time, but no, this is actually just 70 milliseconds and then 10 milliseconds to, to do this. But I guess one of the things I don't really get is like, why, why is there no number? Yeah, what's, I agree with you. What is going on there? Yeah. I don't know what's going on with the plot thing in, at all. It's like clearly gets, takes a huge amount of time, two seconds, two and a half seconds. Right. to plot that I wonder yeah. why <laughs> yeah I know I, I maybe it you. just takes two and a half seconds I don't know well there is like isn't there something like if you're using like the base plotting packages like if you want to export it or something like that you have to do like dev dot off or something mm. like I wonder if it's like waiting to figure out because it's a side effect actually well it's a side effect a, the plot is a side effect because it it opens up some you know visualization tool yeah. where you can look at it. I think it's like X Quartz or something like that if you're not using like our studio, but yeah. it might just be waiting for you to look at the plot and then mm. that's where that like I don't, I don't know I'm just like speculating right now. Oh, I have yeah, no idea. Same. Yeah, same. Your, your, your speculation is as good as I mean better than what I've gotten so far. Interesting though. But yeah, yeah it isn't it show anything there. Is it just too long? It doesn't the bar just doesn't work or wonder what does it you said that was in a in the uh in the documentation, this particular example? Oh, this was just I was just kind of searching around and there was like there was a there was a, an interactive page that was for, for from it was just basically like a tutorial or you know, like a template, you know, just a sort of a explainer for a profis. And I just took this example from the website just as a yeah. And so, because I was like, I was like, yeah, some of this doesn't make sense. Like, why does it take 70 milliseconds to load the data, but like only 10 milliseconds to run a model? It just seems. Uh, not... I found the example that you're looking at. It's from RPG yeah. GitHub.io. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's actually got even a more different result. And it doesn't even show the data taking uh, as a bar on there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, anyway, um, one of the other things that so like by the way, one of what I'm doing here, is, like they they mentioned using this R prof uh, or uh, thing as a way of the profile as a, as an alternative, and I guess it doesn't look as nice. Oh, go, can you go back to that profile thing again? Yeah. Where was it? Oh, this. Yeah. Yeah. What if you click that data tab? Does that give us better better look at it? Yeah. Ah, oh. There we go. So it does it does show oh. the time. It just maybe the bar graph doesn't work well when it's completely out of scale like that. I don't know. Okay, so basically to run the plot, basically it's like this, but then like this D parse is the only other thing. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Well, is is plot like a an S three or something? Uh, that's a good question. That's where I'm getting like the plot, the plot dot formula, plot dot default or something like that, and so. Yeah. Is it like method dispatch that's like slowing it down? I don't know. That's yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. This is this just takes a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. All right. Um, yeah. Another thing. So they use this example here, and I, I only bring this up because they they were like, yeah, this is not a good way to do it. It's not going to be as informative as the the plane plot or whatever. And I'm kind of like, I don't, I don't know. Like, what's wrong with this? I don't, I don't really get it. Um, um, one of the other things, actually, this, so there's one of the, there's a, you know, Q and A kind of like thing. And like, why do we, that's one asks the question, why do we have to make a temp file here? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why this function works this way. Um, but anyway, um, your computer is slow, by the way, because my computer only took 340 milliseconds to make that plot. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> 300. Wow, that's uh, that's uh, that's cold. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, I guess I gotta get, gotta, you know, get my computer. Give me another one. Um, okay, yeah. So Sorry. just real quick, this I thought it's this, Memorial uh, this, Day. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm 
I'm a little punchy from the the sum. <laughs> um, yeah, so I like this. This actually, I, I like this paragraph. I, I, I cribbed it. Um, so yeah, this whole idea of you know this trade off between accuracy and performance. Um, you know, uh, it's you know this idea of it being stochastic means it's just you know just by the nature of measuring something. Kind of like we were talking about Ron last week of you know you, you, when when you try to measure something you you know it, you change yeah in some them, ways yeah and then and, and in fact um, I, I put this someplace here uh, I forget where oh it's, it's actually it's actually uh, well I'll, I'll come to it when we get to micro um, benchmarking or whatever um, yeah so. Um, Oh, and this was another one of these questions from that thing, which is, uh, what is it meant by saying sampling profiler is fundamentally stochastic? I mean, it's just basically we're saying it has systematic variability that is, or um, has variability that is unavoidable, really. Yeah, it, you for for parts of the program that take very little time to run, yeah, there'll be some variability for long. For and he, like he says, the things that matter, the things that are taking up the most of your execution time those will have very little variability yeah hey hold on one second i'll be right back hmm. let's see well i think that when he was asking when he was saying something about the temp file i think that's because that's that's dumping the is it dumping the output into it and then like when you run our prof it's like reading. No, you create the temp file. Yeah. Then you run our prof, which is it doing the sampling. It, right. It samples it and saves it in the temp file. Yep. You run the function and then off prof null, and then you read in the line. So basically, it's like it's trying to aggregate. It's trying to aggregate the results, right? Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Well, that's the same thing of what the flame graph does, right? It's just aggregating yeah, it the results together. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry, my bad. No, you're um, good. Okay, so then visualizing, that's, you know, one of the other, like, last things we'll kind of talk about is you know, just a, a way, um, um, to sort of, you know, do this. But before I get into that, actually, um, so we're using ProViz. At, at one point in the book, he says, if you find if prof prof is or whatever doesn't help your code try util summary or prof or the prof tools package so anyway i i i tried to run this and it doesn't run so i don't even know if i'm doing it right or whatever so i was going to try to like actually show how these things work differently but after i couldn't get this summary um our prof thing to work i was like whatever i don't know <laughs> um i'm with you on that yeah. Oh, and here's, by the way, so this was what you asked before. So why didn't you, so this is, I've actually got the, the code in here now. So to your point, so this should actually look better once I run this, I think. Yeah. yeah look how much better that looks. So that, that by the way, so just so we understand. Um, so now I've, I've, you know, by putting all the, the, the code in a separate file, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's just basically the way it interacts with the function better, I guess. I don't know. How would you explain that, Ron? I don't know how it knows. I mean, is it something in F that tells it that it came from a file? I, I found that confusing too. Like, okay, yeah. it's just some magic. Yeah. You know, it's an advanced R class, but I, yeah. yeah I, this I, is I, actually I, kind of funny. Okay. So, um, and the, maybe I'm, uh, uh, um, <laughs> so, so it's basically to, to run a, a function called pause and make it stop for 100 milliseconds. It takes 60 milliseconds <laughs> <laughs> to do that, right? It's like inflation, you know, it's like everything costs too much in this country now. It's like even the pauses, you know, it's like we all I wanted was 100. I mean, I, I don't know. And why did it? Yeah, that's you take 100 milliseconds, not 60. That's bizarre. Well, no, I think, I think, no, this is, I think this is the process. This is the time it takes to process this function call right oh is that what those are that would explain the, the weird i explain why i didn't understand what i was doing with the other thing then so Maybe. the reason why the plot showed nothing because actually took almost no time to call plot but the time, time was all spent in the flame graph down there i didn't understand that at all that totally yeah. changes my understanding of that it does look a heck of a lot nicer though in this example because it's 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 refer referencing my script file and it's like it, it's actually meaningful as opposed to what we had before which is just 
you know, doing a naked function call and yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. So yeah, this, um, you know, you can kind of look at, you know, things like, oh yeah. So for example, H takes 150 milliseconds, twice as long as G that's not because the function is slower it's because it's called twice as often so yeah you have to be kind of careful how you interpret things because it's not just about one thing being more or less efficient it's about like how much one thing is actually being called and then um talk about like i said uh, profiling uh, and, and visualizing in this idea of the garbage collector was another interesting idea here so um yeah, so when we see this uh, GC thing on our flame graph, that means garbage collector, which basically means it's going in at regular intervals and um, getting rid of um, kind of intermediate steps, I guess. And so, um, yeah, so that basically, which indicates that the garbage is running. If GC is taking a lot of time, it usually indicative of you're creating many short-lived objects. So we're going through, you know, this this loop, you know, a bunch of times. So, you know, for these these sort of um, short, um, you know, kind of looped uh, iterations, you know, it's, it creates a lot of sort of cleanup necessary. And so, um, yeah, and so basically this is an example of which we talked about kind of in early on days, right, of this idea of copy on modify, right? So that's what a loop is, is doing. And hence, that's why we see, you know, um, this stuff. Uh, right. And so any questions about this or? Well, basically that, you know, with, is it, if I remember right to fix that, you want to make your, like, if you're going to run a for loop, you want to make sure you initialize your object to receive that and then just append it. Right. Right. Because yes. then we're not doing the copy on modify. So it's, so like when you hear those arguments of people saying like, oh, R is slow because for loops are slow. Well, right. it's slow because it has to do that copy on modify. And it's not slow because of the copy on modify, but it's the garbage collector that's actually yeah. slowing it down. Right. Is that, is that, is that the way to interpret that? I think so. I think so. I, I mean, I, it's, it's not super clear to me, like, um, you know, um, I don't know. It's it's not super clear to me, but I think that's that's right. It's like the garbage. Well, it's taking you know three hundred and well not three hundred but two hundred two hundred and something milliseconds spent in the garbage collector. Two hundred twenty-five. Yeah. Where do you see two twenty-five? Well, I'm just going like so. The oh, garbage okay. collector starts at one fifty and it job that's at three seventy-five. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You look. You're looking at the same thing I was looking at. You just a lot better at estimating the length of that bar. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that might be the only thing I'm doing better than you today. I promise you. Um, Nevertheless, it's yeah. It's taking time. That when that gray bar is up there, that's what it's doing. It's garbage collecting. It's not doing anything else. Yeah. So that's that's bad, right? Yeah. So it's basically like you know, just, well, not bad, but it seems like you could speed that up by rewriting yeah. the code. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So anyway. Um, yeah. So anyway, so just real quick, uh, we're getting we're getting close at the end here. So some of the limitations. So profiling, you know, obviously in R we use C code, I guess through RCPP, I guess, and other things. So if you have that kind of code that's you know kind of embedded in your work or in your packages or whatever, that that can't be profiled. Anonymous functions are like a popular thing. I don't I don't do them myself a ton because I don't. Well, I mean, I don't usually. I mean. Uh, I usually have complicated functions that I need to make, but, you know, um, yeah, it's hard to kind of profile anonymous functions just because of the way that they're set up. And, you know, we don't get that pretty sort of uh, discrimination that we got in that in this, you know, profile or, or excuse me, in this profile where it's like all the pieces are, you know, we know what they're, they're doing. I don't know that we get that if we have an anonymous function. Um, and then also, um, I thought this was interesting, right? So, you know, if it, it's no good for lazy evaluation, right? So in this code here, we're saying profiling would make it seem like I is being called by J because the argument isn't evaluated until it's needed by J because of lazy evaluation. So that's a problem, right? We can't necessarily um, sort of, you know, uh, do we can't do all this stuff. 
and and figure that out. So yeah, I don't know what the solution is as it relates to lazy evaluation, but there we there it is. Um, so then the last bit here is about micro benchmarking, which I, I kind of just see it as like this is you know a lot more microscopic and a lot more like sort of detailed, and it's not so much about the big picture. Um, but we're trying to you know see like you know one small snippet of code, like what's going on here. And, uh, you know, whereas before we were dealing with milliseconds, now we can have microseconds or nanoseconds. So in a microsecond, I had to kind of refresh my memory on this because it's been a while since I thought about this. <laughs> um, you know, there's a million microseconds in a second and a billion in uh, nanoseconds in a second, right? So, and then of course, I, I, one of the things I do love, um, you know, this idea of, you know, the, well, there's like this kind of warning that he gives us in the chapter where he goes, you know, just because you do this stuff and you go deep and you get into the nanoseconds and it's like you feel like Ant-Man going into the whatever, the quantum <laughs> realm or something. It's like just because it feels that way doesn't necessarily mean it's um, you're, it's 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 sometimes it's hard to know exactly like what all the things that are um influencing this and um, this was like a famous kind of not famous but every video i watched kind of made reference to this which is a deep understanding of subatomic physics is not very helpful when baking and uh, you know obviously we're baking <laughs> here and i'm sure there's a bunch of like really ticky tacky like you know um engineering stuff that kind of in, in, in impacts you know this these time frames that we're talking about right so anyway so my we're gonna favorite my yeah. favorite thing is like when you go on like when you're trying to find like a really like when you're trying to find an answer to a question on stack overflow yeah and someone will like someone will do the answer but then what they'll do is they'll just do like a bunch of like micro benchmarks yes. to show why it's better <laughs> and you're just like you're like i appreciate that you went through the process of like micro benchmarking it for me but yeah. like it's like i'm I just can, trying can, to solve this problem <laughs> i can do even a, a little bit more specific to that example colin you go on to Stack Overflow and you're like, I just need to find something where like, okay, I need to figure out how to do this like filtering or subgrouping or whatever the hell with um, Dplyr. And then you yeah. find it, the question and it's like, how do you do this in Dplyr? And there's always that one guy you, you know, who goes, you have to do it in data table and like does that benchmarking thing like, you know, to, to show, you know, why doing it is more important in data that table or whatever yeah it's like that's not what i didn't ask about this you know what i mean like why why, why you, you know it's always going to be that one person you know if if i need to be working if i need to be worried about working at like the nanosecond scale like yeah <laughs> it's like i i'm doing something wrong <laughs> exactly yeah so anyway this i thought this was pretty cool right so we're we're um we're we're running we're benchmarking two functions which is just the the, the sort of the the standard square root function and then like the sort of the more like kind of just you know rigged or what do you call it, like typed you know version you know, version of this and so the question is is which one of these are slower or faster and so you can see here the top line it says the minimum is 900 nanoseconds and this is five microseconds right so um obviously this the second one is like way slower <laughs> And all things being considered, um, then this now one of the things that's kind of tricky here is uh, you see the, the, this expression, and we don't know. Like maybe I'm like, what, what's, what's, what expression am I dealing with? So you have to go into the actual thing, you know, and it'll show you what the expression is here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah, so the um, yeah, this, this is this. Okay, actually, this is a lot. This is even the median is even better. And in fact, one of the things that they talk about is, you know, focus on the median, the the minimum and the median, not the mean, because of what we'll see in a second. That it's very um, non. You know, there's a very skewed uh, distribution of these times. So um, yeah. So anyway, I thought this was pretty cool, right? I mean, not to say like you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know that I would be doing x to the you know one half power or whatever but uh it's cool to kind of know like what the costs are you know how different they are the memory yeah. allocation is 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 the same right i mean that we get to, we get to the same place it's just it just is a little bit more expensive to do this the second one and oh yeah and so this is um you know, the, the using the uh, the GGB swarm, which I didn't know that was even a package, right? So this is um, the uh, X to the half 
you know, power, and then this is the square root. And so you can see here, obviously, the minimum is a lot lower for square roots, and um, you can kind of see where the distribution kind of, you know, is kind of showing up. But of course, we're getting a lot of outliers as we get into more and more time, just because of the nature of, of what we're measuring. So, um, so that is it. I mean, you know, there's, like I said, this is, um, oh yeah. And so like, like he says, one of the last things he said is, uh, focus on the minimum, the best possible running time and the median, the typical running time, you know, not, not the mean because of this. Okay, oh yeah. Yeah. So I guess the, what I, well, just to kind of bring it all back home, the reason why I was being kind of like, oh, I don't know that we're really learning how to improve our code. I mean, we're, I don't know that we're learning how to improve the code. We're learning how to detect areas for improvement in this chapter does that make sense yeah was, the next I'm, chapter is yeah improved. the next one is that that's all that it's not to say that we're not ever going to do that i was just that was the only kind of provision i was was trying to make but provides anyway that's it and hmm. i i did finish within yeah well, well early so we can have our um <laughs> memorial our day uh recuperation yeah, I think I think the one other thing that I wanted to highlight too from this was like the idea of like instead like he says it right here instead of you know don't rely on your intuition of where you think your code is slow like yeah. actually use the profiler use the tools to identify where your code is running slow because then you could do what's going to be talked about in the next chapter which is like then you could really hyper focus on the areas that you need to fix so yeah no, that's right that's right exactly and so yeah we we spent so much time today just trying to figure out, you know, like how, what, how to interpret these, these outputs as a way of, you know, to, to do that. That's, 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 I guess that's what my point was, but anyway. Uh, so one next, more observation. Yeah. I forgot about from last week about debugging. Does anyone else, is the real, I'm serious. Does anyone else use one of these? <laughs> For debugging? <laughs> I have tried. I've tried. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Colin, right? Yes. Oh, what is this? What does this mean? Right. Oh, Go rubber, ahead, duck, rubber duck debugging. And the idea is, especially if you code a lot by yourself, is you try to explain what's going on out loud to this little rubber duck or to your cat or whatever. Yeah. And somehow, and it does seem to work, it helps you just by describing the problem in, in a school out loud. Uh, and it, it kind of goes back to this idea of uh, the theory of language. What's that? You know, like Stephen Pinker, he wrote that book called The Language Instinct. He talks about mm -hmm. this idea that probably the original, he thinks the theory was the original origin of language was simply to allow you to short circuit parts of your brain because it goes out your mouth and your ears. <laughs> yeah, right. You connect parts of your brain that aren't well connected. Right. And perhaps that's what's going on when you do that, but that's another technique. I guess now you can just explain it all with chat GPT though. But <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true, yeah. Rubber duck, you're retired. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's cool. Well, well it's like, it's like, it's like a reprex though, right? Like if you yeah. like, if you, if you, if you force yourself to like narrow down the problem yeah. and like explain it, That's and then true, like right. it help, like it just helps like immensely. But yeah, no, I've, I, I've tried it once or twice. It's just hard. Cause I work in an office sometimes and, like, I'm sitting there, like <laughs> talking to myself, like people are like, what's, this, what's he doing in there? So yeah, no, but it, it, it's, it's a well-known technique out there. So it works for some people. So, um, but anyway, well, cool. I just happened yeah. to see my little duck here and I wanted to point that out. So I forgot he was even there. <laughs> well, uh, just we're down to the, to the last, uh, last couple of little dregs. I mean, yeah, somehow I drew the, one of the longer chapters. So, oh, is that right? <laughs> 20 is 25. No, right? it's not. I mean, it's just longer than longer for this last few sets. I think it's not nowhere near the longest chapter, but yeah. well, what was the longest chapter? I don't know. It's hard to believe uh, it this much what was the longest chapter? I, was it vector? I know it was one of the early ones, like the yeah. foundations one. It was either like functions or vectors was pretty long. Yeah, like functions is pretty long, and then vectors is up there. <laughs> I mean, he has a whole section in the chapter 25, just like on the on just like a quick run through the standard template library. I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I haven't read it yet, but we'll see. Just do the best you can. I mean, like, I know nothing about 
C plus plus or even C. So this is going to be like brand new and eye opening to me. So yeah. this yeah. is kind of a longer chapter too. You're right. Anyway, guys, I'm going to get some aloe and do my that. Face before yeah. before I, I die of of sunburn. 